case 1039, Trump versus United States. This week's Supreme Court oral arguments dealt with some big issues. Is former President Donald Trump immune from criminal prosecution? A dispute between Starbucks and baristas who were fired after trying to form a union? And whether cities may make it a crime for homeless people to camp in public places? This is PBS News Weekly. I'm John Yang. The Supreme Court ended its current session with a bang. On Thursday, the final oral argument brought perhaps its biggest case this year. Can former President Donald Trump be prosecuted for things he did while in the White House? The case stems from the charges that Trump plotted to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. Decisions are expected no later than early July. Trump offered a response while speaking with reporters. I think the Supreme Court having to do with immunity, I heard the argument was brilliant. Uh, I listened to it last night. I thought it was really great. I thought the judge's questions were great. And all presidents have to have immunity. It has nothing to do with me. Absolutely nothing. All presidents have to have immunity. You don't have a president. Certainly not a president that the founders wanted. Following all of this is the NewsHour's William Brangham and our Supreme Court analyst, Marsha Coyle. They were both in the Supreme Court this morning. Marsha, remind us the basics. What is President Trump's uh, arg argument and what's the government's response? Okay, John, very simply, President Trump is asking the court to say that a former president has absolute immunity for conduct involving his or her official acts and that that immunity stretches all the way to the outer perimeter of his office. Uh, and he's looking to certain clauses in the Constitution and certain precedents to bolster that argument. But the government is saying, basically, there is no immunity clause in the Constitution. Uh, it does not extend to the president's official acts, although uh, the government said today there is a small core group of powers that are in Article II of the Constitution, like the pardon power, uh, the veto power, that are off limits uh, to criminal law. And, William, the justices spent a lot of time today distinguishing or exploring how to distinguish between a private act and a public act. And we've got uh, uh, Justice Elena Kagan uh, posing a hypothetical to, one of, to Trump's attorney. He was the president. He um, uh, is the commander in chief. Um, he talks to his generals all the time. And he told the generals, I don't feel like leaving office. I want to stage a coup. Is, is, is that immune? If it's an official act, there needs to be impeachment and conviction beforehand because the framers viewed the that, that kind of if very If it's an low official risk. act, is it an official act? If it's an official act, it's impeachment. Is it an official act? On, on the way you've described that hypothetical, it could well be. I, I just don't know. You'd have to, again, it's a fact-specific, context-specific determination. That That's answer sounds to me as though it's like, yeah, under my test, it's an official act. But that sure sounds bad, doesn't it? Well, it certainly sounds very bad. William, why is this question so important? Well, as Marcia was just describing, this is trying to delineate what's prosecutable and what is not. And a private act, one that has nothing to do with your official duties as president, if it's criminal, you can be prosecuted. I mean, if you're caught dealing narcotics out of the White House, no one's going to argue that that should not be prosecuted. An official public act is very different, and that's what the heart of this case was all about. And this gets to the heart of Trump's argument, which is that in all of the things that the DOJ alleges he was doing that they argue is a conspiracy to subvert the election, he says, no, that was just part of my talking to the Department of Justice, talking to state elections officials to root out any potential fraud that we were concerned about, and that that's not illegal, first, and that because I was doing it as president, I should be immune from it. And so that is the argument they've been making, and that's where the fight today really rested. Uh, Marsha, what else do the justices seem to be concerned about? Well, there was some concern that um, uh, the criminal laws might be used by political opponents of former presidents to go after them for decisions they made or acts they took. Uh, there was concern uh, that presidents, were, or knowing that there's no immunity, might actually pardon themselves for everything before they leave office. But most importantly, I think there was concern about whether there would be a chilling effect on a president doing his or her duties if there is uh, no immunity at all for official acts. And two justices, uh, Samuel Alito, a conservative, and uh, Justice uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson, one of the liberals, sort of talked about this at, at, from different viewpoints. Very different viewpoints. If a, an incumbent who loses a very close, hotly contested election knows that a real possibility 
uh, after leaving office is not that the president is going to be able to go off into a peaceful retirement, but that the president may be criminally prosecuted by a bitter political opponent, will that not lead us into a cycle that destabilizes the functioning of our country as a democracy? So I think it's exactly the opposite, Justice Alito. There is an appropriate way to challenge things through the courts with evidence. If you lose, you accept the results. That has been the nation's experience. You seem to be worried about the president being chilled. I think that we would have a really significant opposite problem if the president wasn't chilled. If someone with those kinds of powers, the most powerful person in the world, with the greatest amount of authority, um, could go into office knowing that there would be no potential penalty for committing crimes. I'm trying to understand what the disincentive is from turning the Oval Office into, uh, you know, the, 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 the seat of criminal activity in this country. So, Marsha, what's next? Well, uh, a decision uh, at some point. Uh, my sense overall was that the court doesn't seem inclined to buy Mr. Trump's argument for uh, absolute immunity. And uh, if that's the case, and they start trying to delineate, as Williams said, between official acts and private acts, what kind of tests should be applied to do that, they may well send it back to the lower courts to apply it to Mr. Trump's situation. Now, our, the hardest cases that are argued in April generally aren't decided until the end of the term, which would be late June, maybe even early July. But the Supreme Court sets its own schedule. And there's been a lot of talk, discussion, briefs, urging the court to act quickly here so that the trial may get underway at some point uh, before the election. Uh, so I think we just have to wait now, John, and see what happens. And William, what does that timing, what does it potentially do to former President Trump's trial? Well, as Marcia is saying, it's all in the matter of not just how the court rules, but when they rule, because they could still rule in Trump's favor and say, you do not have blanket immunity, as you're arguing. But when they issue that ruling, whether they push it back down to the lower courts or whether they just take a long time, if you look at the calendar, if they if they rule, what, the end of June, early July, Judge Tanya Chutkin has said her case needs about three months before that trial could start for lawyers to catch up on motions and things like that. That if that starts three months later, that is pushing that trial date right at the heart of the election, perhaps as October or November. And there'd be a great deal of pressure on her to not run an elect, not run a case right in the middle of an election. William, I want to ask you about the uh, the indictment in Arizona that we mentioned at the top uh, of the introduction. A grand jury in uh, Arizona returned charges late yesterday against 18 Trump allies for conspiring to overturn the 2020 election results with a fake elector scheme. Uh, they include former chief of staff Mark Meadows, attorneys Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman. And the indictment refers to Trump as unindicted co-conspirator number one. Here's Arizona Attorney General Chris Mayles. The scheme, had it succeeded, would have deprived Arizona's voters of their right to have their votes counted for their chosen president. It effectively would have made their right to vote meaningless. So, William, what exactly are they charged with doing? So this is 18 people who are charged with conspiracy, fraud, and forgery, just as you mentioned, which is all going back to their alleged efforts to deny the fact that Joe Biden won Arizona and Donald Trump did not. It's the seven Trump aides and lawyers that you mentioned, but also 11 of these other people who signed up to be what we've now called fake electors. These are people who knew that, that Trump had not won, but they stood forward and signed documents saying, we will go to Washington, D.C. and cast Arizona's electoral votes for Donald Trump, which he did not win. And so they are being charged with part of, being part of this scheme. As you mentioned, Trump is not named in this charge, but Arizona has now joined four other states that are pursuing similar cases like this at the local level. William Brang and Marcia Coyle, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Also this week, the justices heard arguments in one of the most significant cases on homelessness in decades. They're being asked to decide whether laws fining and even jailing unhoused individuals for setting up camps in public parks is cruel and unusual punishment. Supreme Court analyst Marsha Coyle joined Jeff Bennett to break down the case. 
the lawsuit that was filed by the group of homeless citizens of Grants Pass claimed that the city's ordinances prohibiting camping in public spaces uh, really punished them uh, and violated the Eighth Amendment's cruel and unusual punishment clause. They said they were being punished because of their status as homeless. And the Supreme Court has said in earlier opinions that you cannot punish someone on the basis of their status. Uh, you can punish conduct, but not status. Our team spoke with Ed Johnson. He's an attorney who first brought the suit against this city, Grants Pass, Oregon, as well as Theane Evangelist. She's an attorney representing the city who argued before the court today. These were people who had lived in Grants Pass sometimes for generations, you know, certainly had lived there their whole lives and went to high school there. And then all of a sudden, there was no place for them to live. This is not only not a solution to homelessness, it will make matters worse. They will have a criminal record, which makes it harder to convince an employer or a landlord um, to let you work there or live there. In Grants Pass, in a tent on the Little League field, a dead body was found, believed to be an overdose. This is a very real crisis, and people are dying on our streets. We think it's safer and better for people to avoid camping in public and that cities need to have the tools. These laws help encourage people to accept available shelter. So, Marcia, walk us through these arguments and how the justices tackled them. Well, the arguments really were dominated by this uh, dividing line between status and conduct. For example, the Supreme Court has said you cannot punish someone for being a drug addict. That's punishment on the basis of status. But you can punish conduct, say a drug addict's buying and selling or possession of drugs. So the justices probed, you know, where... Where is the line here between status and conduct? And so we had a lot of hypotheticals from the justices as they talked about, you know, what exactly uh, is homelessness? What is the definition of it? And how do these ordinances play out? And on that, on that point, we heard Justices Kagan and Sotomayor focus on the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment, and their concerns that this criminalizes homelessness. Here's Justice Kagan. Your ordinance prohibits a single person who is homeless, so does not have another place to sleep. That's a status. Who a single camping. person with a blanket. And you don't have to have a tent. You don't have to have a camp. It's a single person with a blanket. Sleeping in public is considered conduct. Sleeping is a biological very... necessity. It's sort of like breathing. I mean, you could say breathing is conduct, too. But presumably, you would not think that it's OK to criminalize breathing in public. And for a homeless person up. who has no place to go, sleeping in public is kind of like breathing in public. And your statute says that person cannot take himself and himself only and, you, you know, can't take a blanket and sleep someplace without it being a crime. So what should we take away from that, Marcia? Well, first of all, during the arguments, it was pretty clear that the court's uh, three more liberal justices uh, are more sympathetic to uh, the homeless uh, residents, citizens of Grants Pass, uh, because they do feel that they are being punished on the basis of their status. And I think Justice Kagan really explained that as clearly as she could, her position here. Um, and yet the city continues to claim that it's not punishing status, it's punishing conduct. The conduct is the camping in public spaces. Meantime, the chief justice appeared to press the Biden administration, who had filed an amicus brief in support of the homeless parties in this case. Here's what he had to say earlier. If there is a, uh, the town next to Grants uh, Pass, uh, uh, 10 minutes away, has just completed building a homeless shelter that has many vacant beds, does that change the analysis here because you don't want to be taken 10 minutes away where there's a homeless shelter? And I think if they're right across the town line, it would be appropriate to take into account that there's a homeless shelter there. So what if it's 30 miles away? Is it 
Uh, is the shelter available in that case? I think I it guess. depends on the accessibility. How the far does that go? Let's say there are five cities all around Grants Pass, and they all have uh, homeless shelters, uh, and yet the person wants to stay. Can that person be given a citation? All right, so help us understand his concerns. Well, he was trying to probe uh, how far uh, the supporters of the, the homeless uh, citizens who filed the lawsuit are, are going to go before a city can actually take action, uh, as Grants Pass has, in fining uh, one of them or even giving them jail time. So he kept extending his hypothetical from uh, you know right across the border of the city, 30 miles away. What if there's a whole group of cities uh, nearby that have uh, shelter available and a homeless uh, citizen does not want to leave Grants Pass? And he was somewhat frustrated with the government's response because uh, the government's response is basically, it depends. Uh, these uh, these people, uh, these homeless residents of Grants Pass have lived there for many, many years, and there's a community of interest that they don't want to leave. And finally, Marsha, where did it appear the justices are leaning in this case, and what are the implications uh, of their ruling? Well, certainly one thing they all agreed upon and said many times is that this is a very difficult policy issue. So my feeling right now is that they are divided and uh, they're going to go back and try to hash this out, maybe find common ground, maybe not. Uh, but it does seem as though uh, the conservative majority is leaning towards the city. And the implications are huge, Jeff, because so many cities are dealing with this problem. And what the Supreme Court has to say about what Grants Pass can do is going to affect how all the other cities try to address this problem. NewsHour Supreme Court analyst Marsha Coyle. Marsha, thanks as always. We appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Jeff. Also before the justices this week, a Starbucks challenge to a lower court decision to reinstate seven Memphis baristas who were fired after they announced plans to unionize. Washington Post reporter Lauren Kaori Gurley was at the court and spoke with us about the arguments. When workers in the United States unionize, if they are retaliated against by their employers, the National Labor Relations Board, um, the, the, agency, the federal agency that oversees um, workers' union rights in the United States, has the right to go to a federal, federal court and ask for immediate relief in the form of forcing a company like Starbucks to reinstate fired workers. So that's exactly actually what happened um, a few years ago at the very beginning of this Starbucks union drive um, that is now sort of, uh, you know, spread like wildfire across the country. There are more than 400 union stores now. Uh, Starbucks fired seven uh, union, uh, union activists at a Memphis store um, and a court ordered that they had to reinstate them. Now, Starbucks is arguing that that uh, reinstatement should not have happened. They said that they fired those workers because they had invited a TV crew into their store after hours, which was against their policy, and they said it was totally within their right to fire those baristas. Now, so what Starbucks was challenging today at the Supreme Court was the test that the, the federal court used in sort of determining whether they had to that whether they could order the reinstatement of those baristas. Um, and so the NLRB was sort of defending um, sort of the authority that it has in, in going to the federal courts to, to ask for that relief and the standard that's used to, to grant that relief. Mm -hmm. And based on the justices' questions, do you have a sense of where they're leaning in this case? It, it very much seemed like they were, you know, poised to agree with Starbucks on this one, um, that, you know, the NLRB, they feel like the NLRB has wielded too much power in that Memphis case, that um, there should be a consistent standard that's applied all across all circuit courts in the United States, which there is not right now. And so it seems likely that they will change this test, which um, or sort of modify this test so it's more consistent across courts across the United States, which labor advocates say could really have a chilling effect um, for union organizing in the United States. And I will say it wasn't just, you know, one side of the ideological spectrum. The majority of the justices, with the exception of Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, really made that point. Um, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson appeared sort of more convinced by the NLRB's case that, you know, Congress sort of bestowed the authority in the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, to conduct investigations um, and that the weight of their findings should be prioritized by federal courts. Well, tell us more about the possible implications of this case. 
And labor activists really believe this could have a chilling effect on labor organizing and union organizing in the United States, which is having this sort of resurgent moment of popularity. You may have heard about it, not just at Starbucks, but at uh, you know the auto workers who unionized last Friday in Chattanooga, Tennessee, at Amazon, at REI, at Trader Joe's. Um, and and these these sort of this, these court orders that um, sort of are at the heart of this case, you know, they're not just used to reinstate fired workers. They also can be used to sort of request bargaining orders that companies um, must adhere to to reopen closed stores. All sorts of ways in which companies retaliate against workers for unionizing. So I think um, if there is a higher standard, which seems likely that the court will do, there will be a much higher bar for for getting that sort of relief for workers, which could make them more afraid. Um, to, to to unionize or which co could cause union campaigns to sort of die out if employers retaliate against workers. Lauren Kaori Gurley with The Washington Post, thanks so much for sharing your reporting with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. And finally, the charged issue of abortion was back at the court this week, this time in a case out of Idaho. The issue was whether a federal law requiring hospitals to provide emergency medical care overrides strict state abortion bans. More than two dozen states ban or severely restrict abortion access, but there are six states, including Idaho, with no health exceptions. Special correspondent Sarah Varney joined Jeff Bennett to break down the day's arguments. So the Idaho law went into effect after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade about two years ago, and it made abortion illegal except when a woman is about to die due to her pregnancy. So the Biden administration sued Idaho, saying that the state's ban conflicts with a federal law called EMTALA, that stands for the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. And EMTALA basically requires hospitals to stabilize all patients, even if that requires an abortion, not just when the patient is about to die, but to preserve their health. And there were some intense exchanges during the session today, especially from the court's liberal wing, who seemed to take issue with the Idaho law. Let's listen to Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Idaho law says the doctor has to determine not that there's merely a serious medical condition, but that the person will die. Yeah. That's a huge difference, counsel. We agree that the, there is daylight between how the administration is reading EMTALA and what Idaho's Defense of Life Act permits. We agree that there is a controversy here. No, 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 no. There's more than a controversy. What you are saying is that there is no federal law on the book that prohibits any state from saying, even if a woman will die, you can't perform an abortion. So what concern is she highlighting here? Justice Sotomayor is saying that if the federal government can't compel states to provide medical care, in a sense that it's always going to be up to the state then to make that call. So then conceivably, a state like Idaho, uh, which does have fetal personhood, could prioritize fetal life over a pregnant woman's life, even when that pregnancy is not likely to survive. Um, and the briefs in this case are full of real life stories of pregnant women being denied standard medical care in Idaho and around the country. Justice Sotomayor described a real life case of a woman in Florida. She was 16 weeks pregnant when she went to the ER and she uh, felt a gush of water leave her body. As many of us who have been pregnant know that that's a pre, uh, premature rupture, which puts you at risk for serious um, uncontrolled infection. She was refused treatment because the fetus, uh, which would not survive, was still alive. And eventually the woman bled out and was finally given an abortion. This was These are the kinds of cases that the justices were bringing up today. And the justices here were focused much more on the harm and suffering, permanent harm, hysterectomies, loss of fertility that uh, women face uh, with pregnancy. And at one point, it was actually really surprising, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who is a staunch opponent of abortion rights, seemed kind of taken aback by what she was hearing that was happening at hospitals in Idaho and elsewhere. I'm kind of shocked, actually, because I thought your own expert had said below that these kinds of cases were covered. And you're now yeah. saying they're not? No, I'm not saying that. That's just my point, Your Honor, is that— Well, you're hedging. I mean, Justice Sotomayor is asking you, would this be covered or not? And it was my understanding that the legislature's witnesses said that these would be covered. Yeah, and those doctors said if they were exercising their medical judgment, they could in good faith determine that life-saving care was necessary. And that's my point, is this a— but some standard. doctors couldn't. Is, is some doctors might reach a contrary conclusion. So, Sarah, in the Dobbs decision, it was Justice Alito who seemed particularly focused on this matter of fetal life. 
And in today's arguments, he talked a lot about unborn children. Regarding the status and the potential interests of an unborn child, the hospital must stabilize the threat to the unborn child. And it seems that the plain meaning is that the hospital must try to eliminate any immediate threat to the child. But performing an abortion is antithetical to that duty. And in many of the cases you're thinking about, there is no possible way to, to stabilize the unborn child because the fetus is sufficiently before viability that it's inevitable that the pregnancy is going to be lost. But Idaho would deny women treatment in that circumstance. So put that portion of the arguments in context for us. So Justice Alito here really appears ready to take up this question of fetal personhood, which is really has been the ultimate goal of the anti-abortion movement for a long time. Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch also mentioned fetal personhood during the arguments. Um, there are laws in Idaho, Alabama, Texas, and many states that um, uh, say that from the very earliest moments of pregnancy, that that pregnancy is a full person under the law. And Justice Alito's stop decision, as you said, you know, and in the qu questioning in the Mifepristone case and here today, really signals a willingness to go there um, and to essentially say that if there's a toss-up between having to choose between um, a, a woman's life, a pregnant woman's life, and a fetus's life, that it's up to the state then to decide who gets to win out in that contest. We know this case will likely reverberate beyond Idaho. What's at stake here? Well, Texas is also sued under a similar premise around Mtala. So if the if Idaho wins in this case, we can we can be sure that at least six states that don't have this health exception for the mother will follow Idaho's lead. I mean, we're already seeing this really play out on the ground in emergency rooms. So you would imagine that those types of cases of women showing up and being turned away from emergency rooms would um, would just continue to escalate. News Hour special correspondent Sarah Varney. Sarah, thanks so much. Thanks, Jeff. For all of us at PBS News Weekly, thanks so much for watching.